meeting tonight is our regularly scheduled monthly official action meeting where the board will, take, will be voting on matters which have been discussed by the board in previous meetings. Our meeting this evening is being videotaped to be shown on community cable channels. Individuals attending our meeting this evening and intending to speak to the board should be aware that you are being videotaped. In order to meet the requirements of the Pennsylvania Sunshine Law, we record the name and address of all the citizens who make comments or questions to the board. In order to comply with this, we ask that you come up and use the microphone at the podium if you have comments or questions during the audience of citizens and begin by giving us your name and address. We also ask that you limit your comments to no more than five minutes in order to give all those who wish to speak to the board the opportunity to do so. If you now would rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation First item on our agenda is approval of the minutes for the 667th meeting held on 1021 as circulated to the board. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Shields, second by Red Camp. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now move to proclamations and I'll call on our board vice president, Ralph Red Camp and Ken Muir. proclamations acknowledging the accomplishments of some fine students from the high school. This particular evening, we're going to be recognizing uh, representatives of the girls' tennis team. In a few moments, I will invite those young women to come forward with their coach, Bob Hurst. Since each of these proclamations has a similar beginning and then is customized for the individual student, I will read the uh, proclamation once. Whereas many North Penn High School students individually and collectively perform distinguished service to their school in many activities, and whereas the reputation and image of the North Penn School District is built and enhanced by the performance of its faculty and students, and whereas the accomplishments of individual students in academic, artistic, athletic, leadership, literary, and musical endeavors bring positive community interest in school programs, and whereas the future of any community rests in the hands of its responsible youth. And then as I said, each of the proclamations is customized, in this case, for the young woman receiving it. Mr. Hurst, if you can get through, will you join me here at the podium, please, and introduce the members of your team. It's going to be tight. Oops. Uh, good evening. I'm here to introduce to you ten young ladies who were representatives on the Suburban One All League selection teams this year. Um, our varsity team, which plays matches, is made up of ten players. And all ten of our players were selected either the first or second team this year, and that's the first time in the 14 years that I've been coaching that that has happened. All ten of these players also were members of the first ever District 1 team championship, which North Penn um, successfully accomplished this year. Um, the first young lady we'll introduce is Lenka Baranova, who as a freshman became the first or has won her first league singles championship in the Patriot Division. You might want to just hold your applause till the end. There's ten of them. <laughs> I'm sure they enjoy that, but it'll be a while. Uh, our number two singles player who also was selected to the first team was Allison Tweedy, who's unable to be here tonight. She's at the Arthur Ashe Tennis Center taking a lesson. Uh, she finished undefeated in the league singles competition and finished second in the league championship tournament behind only her teammate Lenka. And Allison and Lenka together combined to finish fifth in state doubles uh, two weekends ago at Hershey. 
Our third singles player, who also is not here tonight, Carrie DeMauro, she's with Allison at the Arthur Ashe Tennis Center taking lessons, was undefeated in league play and was instrumental in, in two very important victories for us with come, behind, come From Behind wins against Penridge and CB East. Our fourth singles player is a sophomore named Kathy Mallon, who is here. Kathy has a unique distinction on our team this year of being the, to the only totally undefeated player in our lineup. She, won, she went on the court 20 times in four singles and won all 20 <laughs> matches, including uh, the deciding match against Harriton in the District 1 Championship Finals. In doubles, um, doubles team of Andrea Kapusta and Joanne Nasif finished fourth in our league doubles tournament and third in the Downingtown Invitational Championships. Our next doubles team is Carrie Holloway and Aaron Lukens. These young ladies won the league doubles championship for varsity doubles teams. And finally, Marcy Wetzel and Kelly Stock. <coughs> We took the first place in doubles competition at the Downingtown Invitational Tournament, as well as provided critical victories for us in the league championship match against Council Rock and in the District 1 semifinals match against Abington. Congratulations, Vince. We have some additional proclamations tonight. They're a little special. There's nothing routine about them. First, I'd like to represent the board and read a proclamation to William Halberstadt. Whereas William Halberstadt has served this school district in this capacity as a board member since 1989, be it hereby resolved that this Board of School Directors expresses its sincere appreciation to William Haverstadt for his years of service and his concern for the students of the school district. He has served with a strong voice and a clear view of what was right and what needed to be done. He has committed himself to the responsibilities of board service. He has articulated his views with conviction. He has served as chairperson of several committees and has influenced the work of the board in many areas. His board committee membership has included the following. Facilities, curriculum, finance, meet and discuss, policy, buildings and grounds, and the North Monco ABTS Joint Committee. For his willingness to serve and his sense of fairness, he will be remembered. For his belief in the value of strong schools and for his many contributions, we salute him upon the occasion of his retirement from this board. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be forwarded, as it will be framed, to William Halberstadt to show the unanimous gratitude of the Board of School Directors. Mr. resolved that this Board of School Directors expresses its sincere appreciation to Patricia C. Shields for her years of high quality service and her dedication to the youth of the school district. She has served with a keen sense of commitment and responsibility. Her concern for the students of the school district has always been the focus of her work. Her concern for the welfare of the district staff has always been apparent. During her tenure, she has served as chairperson of several committees and has influenced the work of the board in many areas. Her board committee membership has included the following, community relations, curriculum, finance, negotiations, Montgomery County Intermediate Unit, personnel, extracurricular, meet and discuss, and legislative. Her devotion and sincerity were key to her involvement in all aspects of the school district. For her willingness to serve, and for her many contributions to the North Penn Schools, she will be sorely missed. 
For her belief in the need for quality schools, we salute her upon the occasion of her retirement from this board. J. Whalen has served this school district as a school board member since 1983. Be it hereby resolved that this board of school directors expresses its appreciation to Thomas J. Whalen for his many years of service and dedication to the youth of the school district. He has served in a leadership capacity and has given up his many talents to bring reason and order to the deliberations of the board. He has been clear and consistent in his belief in the missions of the public in the mission of the public schools. During his long tenure, he served the board as vice president for six years and as chairperson of many committees. His board committee membership included the following, community relations, policy, facilities, personnel, meet and discuss, negotiations, curriculum, extracurricular, buildings and grounds, and the North Monco AVTS Joint Committee. His sense of fairness and his commitment to the school district staff have been exemplary. His influence and his contributions have been significant for his belief in the value of education and his commitment to the highest standards he will be sorely missed for his caring his knowledge and his devotion he will be remembered as one who gave his best efforts for the youth of the community we salute him upon the occasion of his retirement from this board Patricia Q. Davis has served this school district as a board member since 1983. Be it hereby resolved that this board of school directors expresses its sincere appreciation and reserves its highest accolades for Patricia Q. Davis for her 10 years of exemplary service and dedication to the youth of the school district. She has served with an unusual level of commitment. Her contributions are too numerous to list. <coughs> She has served as school board president for six years and has been a member of the negotiating team numerous times. Her board committee membership has included the following, meet and discuss, North Monco ABTS joint committee, personnel, policy, and finance. Her devotion and energy have carried the board and the district administrators through many challenges. For her insight and vision, for her intellect and her good humor, she will be sorely missed. For her belief in the mission of the public schools, for her sense of fairness, and for her integrity, we salute her upon the occasion of her retirement from this board. Mr. Reckamp, you were about to say something. I was something. going to say that, that uh, uh, these proclamations have a lot of complimentary words. But the four people who are tonight will be their last meeting have put 31 years of service into this community. The hard work, the dedication that thousands of volunteer hours, <laughs> the missed dinner meetings, there is just no way to say how much that's meant to this community. I know a lot of people out there really appreciate it. I know the five board members who are left here, each of which, each of us will have a total of two years experience apiece, are gonna miss the experience and the wisdom that these four people have brought to the board in their collective 31 years of experience. And I would like to personally thank all four of them for their wise and sage leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to say something, too, I don't think we should let them go until we make them cry. <laughs> you don't let us go with it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'd like to, to just add on to what Ralph had to say, and uh, I, too, will miss uh, the leadership and uh, 
probably the, the, the sense of humor that the four of you have provided us with in, in tough times and in terse moments in executive session. And Pat, I, I just I just want to say that I probably of all the board members I will miss you the most. Your your level of intelligence, your sense of humor, but I'm going to miss you most on the uh, negotiating team. You're strong. <laughs> we are going to miss her, Jeff. Uh, anyway, your 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 strong willpower and your tenacity and, and your resolve I, I admire. I've had few opportunities to uh, uh, work with a lady of your caliber, and I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the times we've argued. I've enjoyed the times when we haven't agreed. I'm not going to miss your voting record. <laughs> You're not going to miss mine. But, uh, Pat, I admire you, and I wish uh, all four of you all the riches of God's blessings on yourselves and your families. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Don't leave us. I just have one quick one. Remember, we have lots of community committees that you can volunteer for. <laughs> Thank you all. I believe Mr. Potash wanted to make it. I usually have to wait for my solicitor's report, but so many people are here, and I just want the people here to hear, to hear what I have to say. I've had the good fortune of working with Pat Davis, and I represent over the past 34 years my practice at the bar, many, many school districts. In fact, 10 of them. There are many in Cheltenham, Springfield, North Penn, you know them all. And I'd say Pat Davis is the best president that I've ever worked with. And she stands totally alone in all those people over the years that I've had to deal with, both as a board member and as a president of this board. When you think of what has transpired over the past 10 years, the deadlines we had to meet, construction, the space needs, the deadline of this past year of having to meet the requirements to meet the student needs, and what she accomplished, bringing together some wonderful people here, all of independent thoughts, all people of character, integrity, and molded them into a group of people that really work together and who have been a pleasure for me to work with. And one thing about Pat, she has the utmost of character and integrity, and it has been my pleasure. And Pat, you have my not only my respect, but my undying affection just having known the Lord The Pennsylvania School Boards Association, for which the North Penn School District is a member, for which our school board members are also members, asked me this evening to present awards for outstanding service to our four retired board members. The plaque reads, from the Pennsylvania School Boards Association, award for outstanding service to education. And the first recipient is William R. Haverstadt III. Phil. Congratulations. I'll give you this too. Congratulations. I would also like to just make a few remarks, please. Um, it isn't easy to have nine bosses. Superintendents have nine bosses. Uh, the four people who are leaving the school board have treated me personally with respect, with dignity, and trust. And for that, I thank you personally. As the superintendent of schools, I also represent the 1,300 employees of the school district. And for all of us, we would like to thank you You've allowed us to educate the children well. You've trusted our decisions. You've challenged our decisions. You've given us courage. You've not chastised us when we've been wrong. You've stood beside us. You've stood in front of us. We know that your hearts and, and your heads have been uh, here for the children in the North Penn School District. We are clearly going to miss each and every one of you. And I thank you on behalf of all of our employees. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Pat. I believe that's it for proclamations, and I'm sure that all of you would like to congratulate.
congratulate our student athletes from the tennis team and our four retiring board members. So we will take a three minute break in the atrium. Thank you. If I could just grab the mic for one minute before we do that. Uh, I just, I just want to say what a pleasure it has been serving the community in this district for over 10 years now. I thank the community for giving me the opportunity to serve in this position. And I leave with very mixed feelings. It's, I'm going to miss a lot of people and I'm going to miss the challenge of this position. But it's time for me to move on and it's not only been a pleasure serving, but I think that this position has given me some positive effects in my own life. And I leave feeling that I've made a positive effect on a lot of things in this district. I also leave very confident that we've got the staff and a superintendent who have the <coughs> skills necessary and more important the vision to take this district where we need to go for the future. So I just thank everyone for giving me the opportunity. We'll take a break now. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. We'll continue with our agenda onto our committee reports. Are we going to first? Okay. Beginning with buildings and grounds, Terry. Yeah, report. <laughs> 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 Community services, Tom. No report, Pat. Curriculum, Pat. Uh, yes. Uh, at the November 9th meeting, the board heard the final recommendations of the advisory task force for the realignment of elementary school boundaries. Uh, discussion by the board resulted in an additional recommendation that the Scobie, Jarvis, McNair Lane, and Breezewood Way areas remain a part of the Gwinnett Square attendance area. Since last presentation, the board has received additional <coughs> input to re-examine the boundaries. However, we are not recommending any additional changes. Orientation activities to help students adjust to the new school will be planned for the spring. Opportunities for students and parents to visit the schools will be part of these activities. This item appears on the agenda for action this evening. Charles Keffer also presented a status report on the transition of the sixth grade program <coughs> into the elementary schools in September 94. Science Supervisor Diane Bra Donna Brown excuse me, presented an update on the progress of the Science Curriculum Review Committee and the partnership with the Merck Institute for Science Education. Hands-on science materials will be used on a pilot basis in all district elementary and middle schools this year. That concludes the curriculum report. Thank you, Pat. Extra curriculum, Carlos? Never point. Never. Finance, Bill. Thank you, Pat. Uh, at the October committee meeting, uh, Glenn Williard of Public Financial Management made a presentation concerning options for the refinancing of Bond Series A of 1992 and also authorization to participate in the Emmaus Bond Pool Program. The board voted to allow public <laughs> financial management to proceed with option two on both proposals. Tonight, Mr. Willier, Willier will present the final results of these proposals, and the board will be asked to approve resolutions authorizing both, both the issuance of the general obligation bonds for series AA of 1993 and for the Emmaus Bond Pool Program. Glenn, if you'd like to address both. Okay, thank you. We've handed out several documents, including the preliminary official statement and invitation to bid, which the board has seen several times in the past. If we could look at the uh, document uh, with the orange cover paid labeled bond sale documents, this would be our uh, report on the refunding uh, series AA of 1993 bonds. We conducted a competitive sale uh, beginning on uh, page number two. You can see the bids that were received in our office, a total of four different firms bid. Uh, the winning bid would be, uh, if the board proceeds, would be submitted from a uh, syndicate headed by Mellon Bank. Their true interest cost was 5.26%, uh, second place being at 5.31%, uh, and uh, third and fourth place bids both at a 5.38%. Uh, this was very spirited bidding, and we'll show you results uh, uh, on the next several pages. Beginning on page number three, if you recall this transaction, we were going to carve the Series A of 1992 bonds into two separate series and refund a portion this evening and a portion at a later date, uh, settling in 1994. Uh, page three is the entire series of Series A of 1992. Page four would be the bonds that we will refund out of this series with this transaction, uh, 11110 which leaves on page five, 14007 uh, to be refunded uh, in 1994. Page six is an escrow account that will be set up 
uh, for taking care of all principal and interest payments out to the call date of 9-1-1999. Page 7 is the new bond issue that you're being asked to approve this evening. This uh, contains the interest rates submitted by Mellon Bank as shown in column number 38, ranging from 3.3% on up to 6% at the long end. Uh, if we compare columns 43 and 44 on this page, this is where the bottom line is shown. Net of all fees and expenses. If you do nothing, you'll have column number 44. If you go ahead with the proposal, you have column number 43. And the net savings shown in the far right then, uh, while it is spread out over uh, three, the next, I'm sorry, the current budget year and the next two budget years, it does total about $420,000. And that is well ahead of what our projections were a month or so ago. <coughs> Uh, the next several pages then represent the composition of the bond issue on page 8. Page 9, as I mentioned, is a comparison of how these bonds stack up against other bonds in the marketplace. You see you compare very favorably with, uh, on page 9, then a, a, another issue for the city of Bethlehem uh, that does have AAA rating. And if you look in the far right, you can see that you're a tenth to uh, almost two-tenths of a percent better in many of those selected maturities. So we're very pleased and would recommend you proceed uh, with the uh, Mellon Bank proposal. The last half dozen pages then are actual photocopies of the bid forms and our computer tabulations and, and so on and so forth. So then the, the, first, the first part of this financing came in better than expected. I think we did report to you last time that we thought we could come to you with refunding both the 93 transaction and the 94s this evening. Uh, we were not able to do that. We'll just implement the 93 refunding and need to come back to the board in either December or January with the 1994 refunding, but decided not to do them at the same time. Uh, why don't I go on to the, uh, the next part of the transaction. I think we presented this as a combined financing plan, that being the uh, document with the green cover page. This represents <coughs> the Emmaus bond pool borrowing. Uh, the district had borrowed from the bond pool back in 1989 and in 1990. We had another opportunity using uh, a different structure. Uh, beginning on page number one, we presented to the board that the existing plan, uh, the district has about 40 million of current bond proceeds uh, and probably would contemplate a second financing somewhere out in the uh, calendar year 1995. Uh, in lieu of that, this proposed financing plan was to extend the investment horizon for the existing construction fund proceeds uh, out for another two years or so. Uh, being able to pick up another 75 basis points in the construction program, interest earnings, using the Emmaus bond pool proceeds to be spent first. Uh, the net benefit of this plan was in the lower right-hand corner of page number one, uh, in excess of $200,000 by implementing the Emmaus bond pool uh, financing structure. Uh, all the documents are in place. Uh, you have been approved by the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, would be the letter of credit bank for the Emmaus transaction. I believe last time Marine Midland Bank was your letter of credit bank. Uh, briefly put, everything came in according to plan. I think last time we showed you a number in excess of 600000 by implementing all three steps of the plan. Tonight we're able to deliver in excess of 600000 with just the first two steps. So we still have one leg to go and, and are optimistic that will come in well. Uh, that's a, a brief report, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. We love to see you. <laughs> <laughs> the if good you news, no other, man. I'm sorry. If you have no other questions to me, I would turn it over to Dick Wood, your bond counsel, who will walk you through the appropriate resolutions. <laughs> As I always do, I'd, I'd just like to take a minute to direct your attention to page 9 of uh, Glenn's first handout. I, I think that it's fair for the board to recognize that of the 501 school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there's probably only 10 or 15 districts that have a Moody's rating of an excess of an A. And as you will see, the Moody's rating for North Penn School District continues to be a double A. There are no triple A <coughs> school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I think it's a tribute to the board, to the administration, and to your public who continues to demonstrate a willingness to support the educational program of the district. Uh, this is one of the premier financial school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and you don't get to that point without good management and good board skills, and so I think the board and the administration is to be commended. 
You have two resolutions before you. These have been prepared in conjunction with Mr. Potash's office. Uh, I would propose that if you would address your attention to one that has the large bold cover, this deals with the bond issue of $12,110,000. Uh, I know that the nine board members here uh, gather here this evening are very familiar with this resolution since we've considered a, a format of it on many different occasions, but it recites the fact that you intend to refund the 92 bonds, a portion of them, the Series A, and that you've received a proposal as presented to you by uh, Glenn this evening. You're authorizing and directing issuance of the bonds, the acceptance of that purchase proposal, the authorization to incur the debt, and you're pledging your full faith, credit, and taxing power in support of your covenant to budget, appropriate, and pay the debt service on the bonds, authorizing necessary filings with the Department of Community Affairs, directing the call for redemption of the Series A of 1992 bonds. If there's any questions on the resolution with respect to the 12110000 issue, I'll be glad to answer them. Any other questions on the numbers, I'm sure Glenn will be glad to entertain questions on that. If not, there should be a motion, a second, a roll call vote it requires five affirmative votes for passage. I will so move the resolution. Second. Are we doing, we can do them both together? I'd rather do them separately. 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 Do them separately. Okay, so we're, then we're working on resolution number one, for authorizing the issuance of general obligation bonds, series AA of 93, in the amount of 12105000 Can you do roll call? Mr. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Halberstadt? Yes. Ms. Leahy? Yes. Ms. Mingle? Yes. Mrs. Spakowski? Yes. Mr. Reckamp? Yes. Mrs. Shields? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. We have nine affirmative votes. And just to correct that, that's 12,110,000. Is that right? Correct. The second resolution is consists of two parts. You will be borrowing $25 million from the Emmaus General Authority and also a $25,619,617 million general obligation note Series B of 1994, which is the letter of credit note. Uh, it does not constitute a double borrowing or a double counting, but nevertheless, for state law purposes, there is a double incurrence of the debt. This resolution does substantively the same thing. It authorizes and directs the issuance of the two notes, approves a credit agreement, authorizes uh, and directs the uh, district to enter into the various legal documents necessary to implement the transaction, pledges your full faith, credit, and taxing power, in support of your obligation to pay principal and the interest of the note. If there's any questions on the second resolution, again, I'll be glad to answer those. Any questions? If not, do I have a motion and a second? So second. moved. Second. Motion by Haberstadt, second by Shields. Any questions? All those, oh, I'm sorry, roll call. Okay. Mr. Bowman? Yes. Mr. Haberstadt? Yes. Mrs. Leahy? Yes. Ms. Mingle? Yes. Mrs. Spakowski? Yes. Mr. Reckamp? Yes. Mrs. Shields? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Once again, we have nine affirmative votes. Thank you, Glenn and Dick, for coming out. And, Bill, is there anything else under finance this evening? Uh, no, that's it. Uh, okay. We're all what are we going to do without you? you know, you <laughs> 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 last official. Yeah, we'll be last official. Okay, we have to move on to personnel. Donna? Yes, uh, thank you, report, uh, Mrs. Davis. Uh, we have much to cover in personnel tonight. Um, there are a couple of items that I, uh, we have the pleasure personnel to bring up, even though they are, uh, will be, uh, I guess, ratified under uh, the superintendent's Use report. The Can't hear. Use the mic. Yeah. I'm sorry. As the board's aware, we've been moving ahead with plans for the two, mil, uh, two new elementary buildings, and a part of that plan, of course, includes the selection of uh, building principals for both Bridal Path and Walton Farm. Uh, Fred and I are pleased to announce that uh, Dr. Marianne Kamer will be assigned to Walton Farms Elementary School, and 
with uh, great pleasure and a little regret, Dr. Thomas Sugar will be assigned to Broadell Path Elementary School. The administration will also be assigning Mrs. Leah Thompson at the new, as the new principal at Gwenyon. All of these assignments will be effective July 1st, 1994. Also, there is an agenda item recommending Mrs. Anna Heffron as an elementary principal effective July 1, 94. Her assignment will be at the Knapp Elementary School. There is one other agenda item that I need to mention, and that is the appointment of Mrs. Susan Singerson as the Supervisor of Staff Development and Strategic Planning effective November 19, 1993. Mrs. Singerson's role in staff development has increased significantly, and our serious need regarding strategic planning necessitates action at this time. I will be recommending approval of both positions. Also, in light of the most unfortunate incident with the uh, handout, the health handout that we was brought to our attention about a month ago, uh, I. will not happen again. Uh, I have to support this um, recommendation coming from personnel. Uh, I felt, I, I wish personally could have been a bit more stringent, but we have to operate within the law and I recommend we do so. Uh, also, Mr. Schmidt has some comments he would like to make on behalf of the board regarding our negotiations. Thank you, Mr. Mangle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He has one. I have one here. Fred's work. Can we move him down? Yours doesn't work. Please, um, mine doesn't work? It works now. It works now. <laughs> well, that's because somebody gave me another one. <laughs> All right. Ralph's doesn't work. Okay. I need to make a statement on behalf of the board tonight. It's regarding the negotiations with the NPEA. On Wednesday evening, November 3rd, 1993, the board negotiating team met with the NPEA negotiating team. At that time, the mediator was not in, uh, present. I need to talk a little bit about that meeting in detail because the board made what it considers to be significant concessions in an attempt to try and bring resolution to the contract impasse. The meeting itself was initiated by an overture from the NPEA. And although the NPEA leadership wanted to approach this meeting in an informal way, the board made it perfectly clear that they would only be interested in being there for the purpose of trying to negotiate a contract. Unfortunately, the NPEA negotiating team did not appear interested in negotiating or in settling. Before I begin, though, I do need to say a couple of things. First of all, the board and this administration are quite proud of the quality of the professional staff in the North Penn School District. We feel that it's important to treat employees in a fair and professional way we all work very hard at doing just that. It's not our intent to try and demean nor insult our professional staff, uh, nor to let the negotiations process deteriorate to a level that would be embarrassing to either or both sides. Nor do we want to see this community divided the way that some other school districts have become. <coughs> In spite of our obvious, obvious differences, it's important for the community to understand that unlike other districts where the contract has not been resolved, our professional staff continues to work extremely hard and without any of the game playing that is so prevalent in today's negotiations with teacher unions and which impacts so directly and so negatively on the students. Secondly, it's important to note that the board certainly recognizes its main mission, and that's to provide a quality education to all the students in the North Penn School District. This commitment is always foremost in the minds of this board. The board has been willing to do everything that it can to meet that commitment and at the very same time uh, do the very best it can in understanding just how much this district can afford and just how much of a burden the community is willing to support. Thirdly, it might be quite helpful in better understanding the board's position by knowing exactly what the board's agenda has been. Back in January when the board first met with the NPEA, the board laid out some very specific goals. 
The board told the NPEA at that time it was this board's strong belief that the perception that our teachers were not fully nor fairly paid was no longer a valid perception. Over the past four years, the board has provided increases approximately 49.1% that were more than triple the cost of living. Even this understates the actual cost because we had had significant movement across the salary schedule due to changes in preparation level and also in degrees. <coughs> During these four years, the board has provided job security over a period of time that has brought enormous layoffs in the private sector with both blue and white collar workers being affected. The board has also seen continued significant growth in our cost for our medical benefits. That relates to over a million dollars increased cost this year alone. We've seen both our support and administrative staffs as participants with the district in recognizing what is happening in today's economy. While the leadership of the union continues to ask for unreasonable raises and minimal, although they never gave us a number, contributions for cost sharing of the benefits. It was made perfectly clear from the beginning of negotiations that this board was not interested in being compared to what other school districts were doing. That judgments regarding a new contract would be based only on what this board felt was fair and equitable to our teachers and in line with our community's ability to pay. The board's thinking is colored by its concern over the economy, it's mindful of the need for its costing new buildings. We're extremely worried over the ever-expanding number of assessment appeals and the continuing concern over our escalating debt service. When approached by the NPA to meet the board team, which consists of Mrs. Shields, Mrs. Davis, who is chairperson, and Ms. Mangle, they all agreed that it was worth meeting and that the board should position itself so that they had everything they needed to try and settle. After this board team met with the chief negotiator, myself, and then worked out a package to present to the NPEA, the board met with, or the team met with the full board to seek concurrence on what would become the board's final offer. The board did so concur. Prior to the November 3rd, 1993 meeting, the two teams had identified the framework of a contract although the details on all items were left unsettled. If the major issues could be resolved, both sides felt that the other things would fall into place. The major issues centered around salary, cost sharing of the benefits, and time. At the meeting on November 3, 1993, a couple of hours were spent with three members of the NPEA team. The other team members, although in attendance, were in a separate room. Uh, they also had their chief negotiator from PSEA with them. Uh, the board had three members, the members that I mentioned and myself. While the discussions were quite candid, they were not necessarily directed at specific issues. The board did, however, <laughs> indicate that their last salary offer of 2%, 2%, and 2% could be moved around and considered as a maximum of 6% over three years. The board also indicated that although they were locked into cost sharing of a maximum of $60 per month for the first or for family coverage, minimum of $30 per month for single coverage for the insurance benefits, there was still room to move away from the board's last proposal of a maximum of $80 per month in the second year and $100 per month in the third year. The NPEA negotiating team asked a caucus and about a half hour later, the president of the NPEA <coughs> came to the board and indicated that since the board was unwilling to reconsider its position regarding cost sharing of the benefits, the NPEA felt there was little use in continuing and, and, continuing and wanted the board to know that they were leaving. The president of the NPEA was asked to go back to his team and make sure that that was the position that they wanted to take. He returned a few minutes later and indicated that in fact it was. The board asked for about 10 minutes to themselves and asked that the NPEA team meet in the conference room with them. When the two teams came together, the board team indicated disappointment at the lack of interest on the part of the NPEA in trying to negotiate a contract. The board therefore presented to the NPEA the package that they had hoped could be arrived at mutually. The NPEA was told that this package represented a final offer 
and as such would not be subject to change, not in December, not in June, not at all. The NPEA leadership was asked to consider this final offer for one week, take it back to the board, and let the board know what their decision <coughs> was. The NPEA leadership was also asked to take the final offer to the membership if the NPEA negotiating team decided to reject it. On Wednesday, November 10th, 1993, the NPEA negotiating team held a general membership meeting. A recommendation by the negotiating team to reject the board's final offer was overwhelmingly rejected by a, vo a voice vote of those in attendance. I want to take just a few minutes and share with the community what the components of that final offer were and also what the logic was that the board used in determining what improvements were to be made. The board has proposed a three-year contract. That was proposed back in January. Obviously, with almost the first year going now, that, that still makes an awful lot of sense. As far as salary is concerned, the board in their final offer has proposed salary increases of 3.2% in each of three years. The board indicated to the NPEA that it was willing to work with the NPEA in regards to how that money gets distributed. This is a total of 3.2% each year, 9.9% over three years. <coughs> Obviously, that's compounded. It's the full amount the board is willing to give. Individual salary schedules could be mutually determined by both the board and the union, as they always have been in the past. The board is willing to consider 3%, 3.2% for everyone in each of the three years or some other configuration that would deem to be fair. As far as the insurances, and obviously it's a major issue, has been with the board, and it certainly has been a, a major stumbling block with the union. The board has proposed a medical, dental, and vision program that, recall, that requires cost sharing by the bargaining unit for the first time. Up until this point in time, 100% of the benefits have paid, been paid for by the board. The board wants the union to participate in the Section 125 Flexible Benefits Program that currently exists in the district for the administrative and support staff. The Section 125 is a reference to the IRS code that allows uh, companies, districts like us, to provide this sort of, uh, of a program which has some tax benefits to it. The Flexible Benefits Program provides a variety of plans and options which are geared more to individual needs than the current program where everybody gets everything. This plan includes some core benefits that are fully paid for by the board, such as life insurance and disability income protection, but it also includes the opportunity to pick and choose from a menu of options. Each individual is given a certain amount of money to work with each month. That amount, however, is not sufficient to fully cover the cost of the optional benefits, the medical, the dental, and the vision. And that is where the cost sharing comes in. The board has proposed that for the first year of the contract, bargaining unit members who take family coverage for medical would pay $56.50 per month. Family coverage for the dental plan would cost $2.50 per month, and it would cost $1 per month for the vision plan, either single or family. The bargaining unit member took employee-only coverage. The cost for the first year would be $27 per month for medical, $2 per month for dental, and $1 per month for vision. For the sake of comparisons, I'm only using two different employee groups, uh, while it, there are actually five different employee groups. There's the single, there is the employee and spouse, employee child, employee children, and the family coverage. The second year of the contract, family <coughs> coverage for medical would be cost $65 per month. Family coverage for dental costs $3 per month, and vision for, uh, uh, for single or family would be $1.50. Employee only coverage for medical in the second year would be $31 per month, $2.50 per month for dental, and $1.50 for vision. The third year of the contract, family coverage for medical would be $74 per month. Family coverage for dental costs $4 per month and vision would cost $2 per month for single or family. Employee coverage is there for medical, $34.50 per month, $3.50 per month for dental, and $2 for vision. One of the advantages of the Flex Benefits Program is that the amount an employee contributes each month can be calculated pre-tax, uh, pre-payroll tax, which actually affects the savings. 
This means as an example, if you're paying $60 per month and have that taken out pre-tax, there is a net savings of perhaps around 28%, the 28% being uh, typically the, the, uh, the amount that uh, is used in, in averages as far as what the, the taxable or what, what people typically pay in taxes. In other words, that $60 per month uh, would actually cost a total of about $43.20. It is safe to say that even though the cost of the benefits must be taken out of the salary improvement, no one will make less money over the course of this contract. There are other advantages to the Section 125 Flexible Benefits Plan. If an employee has a spouse who has family coverage at their place of employment, then the bargaining unit member can cash out and take cash instead. Obviously, since this is cash, it would be taxable. Employees also have the opportunity to put pre-tax money into a dependent care or medical spending account. In the dependent care account, an employee can put up to $5,000 per year to, a dependent pay, to be paid to a dependent provider. Since this is pre-tax, again, I'm using the cost savings of approximately 28%. <clears throat> Therefore, if an employee is currently spending $5,000 per year for babysitting, it would cost only about $3,600 or have the net effect of a savings of about $1,400. The medical spending account offers similar pre-tax savings, although the maximum an employee could put into the medical spending account would be $2,000. Bargaining unit members would also have the option to participate in tax shelter and annuities and also to buy more coverage and life insurance benefits that currently exist for the bargaining unit. Further, in terms of other things that the board has propo proposed in their final offer, uh, the same amount of life insurance equal to uh, a base salary uh, since again this is a uh, uh, in, in related to the base salary that goes up each year uh, not only because of the improvement in salary but also because of the fact that people move horizontally across the salary schedule as a result of additional credits or additional degrees I don't want to mislead anybody in terms of trying to cite that as an example of what the board is doing that is not a big cost item but it is something that the board has improved. The district will reimburse for coursework in the amount of $126 per credit in year one, $132 per credit in year two, and $139 per credit in year three. This would be predicated upon a B or better being attained for each course taken. In the current contract, the minimum uh, that is required is a C. <coughs> The, the logic for what we're doing with a number of these different things relates back to what we have done in the existing contract. These are the same kinds of increases that we have provided in the current contract. Summer teaching curriculum development, we've improved again, 21, 22, 23 dollars per hour. That is the same formula that has been used over the past contract. So it is improved in the same way that it had been before. Staff development work, the same thing. It has been improved to 29, 30 and $31 per hour in year uh, one, two, and three. That increases at the same rate in the current contract. We also have staff development where uh, some of our teachers teach IU approved graduate courses and we pay at the rate of a credit hour. That credit hour will be $545 in year one, $565 in year two, $585 per credit hour in year three. That is the same formula that has been used in the current contract. Our extra duty contracts, the board's final offer included 3.2% improvement in each of the three years. I want to take just a second to explain where that 3.2% came because we use it for the salary, we use it for several other things. Back in January when the board first put together its initial proposal, uh, the board's interest was in dealing with what cost of living was. That seemed to be a, a, a prominent uh, a uh, number that happens in industry and business, and it was felt that uh, based on the cost of living that had actually increased uh, not much more than 15% over three years, and a contract that had uh, uh, rewarded teachers at close to 50%, that a cost of living increase was something that was, was uh, uh, needed. Uh, that 3.2% was the higher end of, of the range that was running somewhere between about 2.8 and 3.2% at that time. Uh, current cost of living is, is below 2%, probably about 1.8%. Uh, the board has added two days 
going from 20 to 22 days per year for NPEA uh, to use for official business functions of the Pennsylvania State Education Association. Uh, the board has granted three personal days each year in the past in the past, two of those days could be taken without reason. <coughs> the board is now saying that all three of those days can be taken without reason. Homebound instruction has been improved a dollar per hour for each of the three years, 21, 22, and 23 dollars. That increases the same rate as in the current contract. <coughs> we have some miscellaneous positions that appear in the contract. Those positions will be uh, improved by 3.2 percent in each of the three years. We have department chair positions in the contract. And there is a stipend for experience, and in each of the three years, that stipend will be improved by 3.2 percent. The teacher work year, currently the teachers work 185 days per year. The board's final proposal includes uh, an additional day in, in this current year, an additional day next year going from 185 to 187 days. Also chaperoning, the rate of pay shall be $46 per activity in the first year. $48 in, in year two, and $50 per activity in year three. Again, that is the same improvement that occurs in, this, in the existing contract. I began by saying the board was willing to try and negotiate a contract, but the NPEA leadership offered nothing. Up to that point in time, up to this point in time, the board has had no concrete <coughs> proposals from the union. That's why the board felt compelled to give everything that the board had authorized. Uh, then the board team has given everything that they've been authorized to give. There is no more, and there's no intention on the part of this board to meet with the NPA again. I thank you very much. Mrs. Davis, that pretty well concludes personnel report, and uh, we don't apologize for the length. This, uh, this information tonight is important. I have to say uh, to Pat and, and to Pat, thank you again many many times over for you hanging in there on the negotiating team putting in the hours also to Ralph uh, the times that you put in supporting Pat when she was away this summer uh, you hate to see something like this go ahead and it, work put into it for it to be uh, in vain and all to go for naught but I think it's important that we recognize tonight before the four of you leave that there are five of us left and the five of us were as committed uh, a few weeks ago when we decided as a board to present this to the, uh, to the union uh, were the same five people and I feel committed tonight. Two years ago when I ran for this seat, this is exactly what I said was all I'm willing to do. I will never, ever, ever, regardless how long I sit here, do better than this. And I was hoping to convince the union that I meant that. Um, I'm disappointed as the team member. I'm disappointed as a parent. I think this was a good deal and it was an opportunity to take a deal off a very reasonable board. And I think the nine of us, as a conglomerate, are reasonable people. I am not so sure that this will be this, that this could ever be brought back again after the four of you leave. I do not know what the new board members will do. I do know that the cost of living has changed and it's no longer 3.2. And I don't know if those four board members are going to want to see a change in what we have done here and what we have offered. So I am disappointed but may it go on the record that I will not change from what is on this table. It will never change from me. And I can't speak for the rest of you, but Aye. I'm not moving. You'll not go higher. <laughs> oh, I could be tempted to go lower. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> certainly. Thank you. In a heartbeat, I could go lower. <laughs> Just wanted to check with you on that. Yes, but this was put out in an attempt to get a contract off of this very reasonable board. And I think we worked up to the last hour trying to do that. And I thank you, ladies, again and again. Thank you, Thank you, Donna. Fred, if I could just make a short statement. Um, as you said, Donna, I'm, I'm very personally disappointed that this state of affairs has come to this. We as a board, especially those of us leaving, really felt it was our obligation to make every attempt we could to settle this contract. It was our job. We were charged with that. And we really didn't want to dump it in the lap of new board members coming on. In order to try and do that, we made what we feel was a good faith effort and a very generous offer in our minds, well above now what cost of living stands at, of that 3.2% for each year over a three-year contract. It's apparent to me from the union leadership's recommendation to reject this offer that they simply have no concept of the economic realities that we're all dealing with today outside. It further seems apparent to me from the fear of many teachers after the membership meeting who believe that they will now make much less, thousands of dollars less under this new proposal, 
that the proposal was presented in a very confusing manner by the leadership or worse yet was totally misrepresented to their membership. I feel that our membership here in this district has lost out enormously and that this situation and the union leaders actions bode nothing positive at all for any future settlement. <coughs> Thank you for that note. We appreciate the work that you put into it. It's, it's more than a job for you. It's a commitment, and we have seen you not only perform uh, your job and your tasks as we would wish, but also a commitment that has gone above and beyond what you're paid. And I thank, thank you. you. That concludes our report, Mrs. Davis. Thank you, Donna. Now we'll move to legislative funding. Yes, Pat. Uh, the legislation will only be in session for a few weeks before breaking for the holidays. There are a few bills dealing with mandates that we need to get back to our legislators about. You will, be, you will all be getting a short breakdown of each bill in a packet. All are mandates that cost the school district money above and beyond what the state reimburses. One bill that has passed the Senate is Senate Bill 4. It is a constitutional amendment bill that requires mandates to be fully funded. Along that line is a resolution that Representative Cohen is also looking to submit. That is also an amendment to the Constitution, but it adds regulations to the fully funded equation. At the state legislation meeting last night, we agreed that, the, that we would like to see Representative Cohen's bill as an amendment of Senate Bill 4, since that bill is further along <coughs> in the process. We also are writing as Montgomery County School Boards to the chairpersons of the committees introducing the mandate bills. However, I believe we need to also communicate as a board to our own legislators. If you will look over the bills when you receive the packet and get back to me as to any concerns or comments by the end of next week, we can then send a letter to our legislators urging them to support these bills. A very interesting note of, in note of interest. There is a school district in Delaware that breaks out the number of mills that it costs for state mandates and prints it on the tax bill that they send out to all the residents. <laughs> oh, here, here, like here, here. Yeah. Yeah. We do that. I would suggest sure we that. <laughs> that we do that so that people realize that what the state is taxing us and we end up having to tax our community is a substantial amount of our budget. And that ends my report. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Carmen. Mrs. Mrs. Leahy, was that uh, initiative uh, the one that came out of the Souderton School Board? The, the one you were talking about, about uh, Delaware. Mr. No, it was in Del Delaware? Delaware County. Because I know Satterton just did something. I guess maybe they no, just sent we will. Through. I will be bringing that up later. Oh, okay. There is, uh, what has been introduced is that the PSBA has recommended that school boards do a resolution stating that mandates should be fully funded. So in the next meeting, I will, once I have the paperwork, I'll be bringing that up. But certain school districts have already taken that resolution. Any other questions? Thanks. Thanks, Carmen. Anything on the IU yet? No, no report. Municipal, Donna? Yes, uh, just a short report that we did meet the uh, Thursday um, last Thursday night, Mrs. Davis, and at that meeting we went over how much money each municipality has to put towards their uh, DARE program. Uh, it ranged from $1,500 from one of our smaller municipalities to $15,000 from one of the more larger. So I guess it's a range as to the level of commitment that the municipalities have been willing to put forth from their, ta from their tax dollars towards a program of, uh, of such importance and of such magnitude in our district. We also had a, uh, an excellent presentation provided to us by our solicitor, Charlie Potash, and also Gilbert High from Norristown, a, a distinguished attorney, who addressed the issue of reassessment. <coughs> Uh, not only did they address it, but we would, had the opportunity to tear the issue apart and recognize it for what it is. And uh, what it is is a monster, and it's a hemorrhaging monster because uh, it's catching on as a trend, and for every successful uh, reassessment of taxes, it comes directly out of here, uh, out of the school district, which leaves a hole which we somehow have to patch on top of all the uh, state mandates that come unfunded, then we have that. So as we sit here and listen to Glenn Willard's report and, and, and the fine job that he has done in recapturing some monies for us in a fiscally responsible way, on one hand we have this and we have it coming out over here. So uh, nobody should think for one moment, the union included, that we are rich. So um, we had a fine meeting, municipal relations. We uh, are attempting to um, 
to put together a meeting of the legislators. We expect our legislators to attend that meeting. Uh, we would like to address this matter to them in hopes that they will go to the legislature and fix it, remedy it from that <coughs> aspect. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a area of, uh, an area of interest to, to many attorneys. Many attorneys make uh, money doing reassessments. So it's going to be difficult to find uh, those legislators committed to rectifying a situation that is causing such harm and damage to our school district. Um, that would uh, conclude my uh, remarks, Mrs. Davis. We do have a meeting in January 94. As you know, this is a quarterly meeting municipal relations holds. Okay, thanks, Donna. Sure. George Monco, Bill. Uh, yeah, Pat, a short report. Uh, tonight the board's going to be asked to uh, approve a resolution that allows us to rent uh, at a dollar a year, four acres of land we <coughs> take at the Votech uh, for <coughs> the North Penn School District to use for bus parking and uh, athletic fields. That's about it. Okay, and facilities. Oh, I'm sorry, policy, Dick. No report. Hmm. Facilities, Bill. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a few items. Uh, first, with Bridal Path, uh, the construction in Montgomery Township, uh, all the underground utilities uh, have been installed. Most of the curbs are in place. The parking area and the driveways have been stoned. Uh, the structural steel has been in place, been set in place in the classroom area, the multi-purpose room pod area. Steel work has begun. Roof decking is in place, and the second level concrete floor has been poured. Uh, over at Walton Farm, uh, stormwater piping is in progress. Curbs are in place in some areas, and the structural steel is set in multi-purpose room area. Concrete floors on grade are being poured now. Uh, the electrical conduit and the plumbing piping has all been installed below grades. And in both those buildings, all the masonry work is, is progressing rather rapidly in the hopes of them closing uh, before the bad weather sets in. At AM Culp, uh, the modular classrooms <laughs> are in place. And the work continues uh, to proceed so that we may begin carpeting and the other requirements needed prior to occupancy. Um, the electrical service is being installed and all the plumbing tie-ins are underway. Uh, hopefully we'll take occupancy in December. I uh, have the high school architect, the new high school architect selection process. Um, <clears throat> Terry Pukowski and Ralph Reckamp and Art Wood and myself spent uh, the entire day yesterday visiting new secondary school buildings uh, in the eastern part of the state uh, so that we could evaluate the work of the three architects <laughs> that have recently designed this type of facility in the Commonwealth. Uh, the experience is very worthwhile and will offer great assistance uh, in the selection process which will allow the district to appoint an architect in December after the new board members have received it. Uh, as the committee reports, Pat, we also have two resolutions. Uh, first of which I'd like to recommend approval of a resolution declaring certain property in Upper Gwinnett Township as surplus land. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Whalen. Well, any questions on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'd like to recommend approval of an agreement that amends lease number two dated October 18, 1993 between the North Monco ABTS and North Penn School District allowing for the lease of an additional four plus or minus acres of land. <laughs> Second. Motion by Shield, second by Bowman. Any questions? Just a comment, Mrs. Yes. Davis. I think kudos are in order for Ralph Faircamp, who has uh, <coughs> taken the extra amount of time out of his personal life to work uh, so hard on this. Uh, certainly the weight and reputation of the, the, the three of us on the Votech board was able to do a certain amount of convincing of our colleagues to allow this to happen. But it was uh, Ralph that uh, ran interference between all the other board members and, and the administration there and carried uh, certainly the lion's share of the load on trying to accomplish that. So um, kudos to Ralph, and I appreciate it. And I think it means that girls' soccer will no longer have to be bused to Penfield to play. Well, Ralph's a ladies' man. <laughs> they got the girls' a soccer field. Uh, any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, that's the end of our committee reports. With that, we'll move to audience of citizens. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Wendy Urban, 855 Keeler Road, Lansdale. Um, I'm representing my neighbors. They've asked me to speak for them tonight. Many of them are here um, with me today. One of them's here. Many of them are also sitting down. 
Um, I'm going to speak for all of us so that you don't have to listen to the same thing multiple times. And I've spoken to you many times, or many of you on the phone, about our um, concerns with the elementary school boundaries as they stand after the second set of boundaries. I'm a little distressed to hear that um, you may have already made your decisions because in my conversations with many of you, you've indicated that you're still open to new ideas and that you didn't consider things closed until after tonight. And since we haven't spoken publicly to give our point of view on it, I was, I was hoping and I had confirmed, had had confirmed for many of you that the comments tonight would definitely be taken into account and I'm still hoping that our concerns are treated with the same equality that the earlier concerns after the first plan um, were given and the same consideration that they were given. We live in the northern area, uh, the northern portion of Area 27 in a very, very small area. There's 23 houses in our development and um, a couple more along Keeler Road. We're talking the homes in the northern part of Area 27, Keel, part of Keeler Road and Tennis Way. There's a creek that runs right behind our houses and there's a tributary to that creek that runs right out at the end of our development. We're asking that you consider including us in, in Walton Farm School instead of in Inglewood School. We realize that this means that our children will be moved to a new school. The original plan had us in Walton Farm School, which is where we all strongly feel we belong. Our entire neighborhood supports that our children go to Walton Farm School instead of Inglewood School. Our neighborhood, as we see it, our entire community is going to Walton Farm School. If you look at your maps, you'll notice that Tennis Way and Tennis Circle are a contiguous street. Uh, I guess their names were meant to indicate that, but they are a continuous street, only, for, only separated by Keeler Road. Keeler is not a major road like Allentown Road would be considered or Summitown Pike. It's a much smaller road. And by using Keeler Road instead of the creek as a boundary line, you are truly splitting our neighborhood and sending all of our children's friends and our true neighbors to a different school. The, we are hoping that you will use the natural boundary line of the creek as the boundary for Walton Farm instead of Keeler Road. We know that the same justification was used in other areas because the, the creek is a natural boundary and Keeler Road would be an artificial boundary. As I mentioned, our community, our neighborhood, what we consider to be part of our area spans across Keeler Road and into Tennis Circle. We're only talking about 23 houses and seven children, therefore it should not affect the numbers on either school, either Englewood or Walton Farm. We would strongly suggest that you, you amend the proposal to include us in Walton Farm. It's a school that we can walk to. Our children would be able to walk to many of their friends' houses, which they will not be able to do if they go to Englewood. It's only about half of a mile from our homes to Walton Farm School and much further to Englewood School. For our children, the transition to a new school is much easier than the trauma of losing their friends and separating our community. They can deal with going to a new building much easier than they will be able to deal with having new friendships and being able to um, make new friends and um, leaving what they are used to having. <clears throat> In summary, many of you, as I mentioned, have agreed with this proposal before. We're hoping that you make a decision tonight based on what is reasonable and based on what you believe is right versus the fact that it's late in the game and we were not affected by the first proposal. We're hoping that you give us equal consideration and consider our proposal and send our children to Walton Farm in order to keep our neighborhood together. At this point, I'd like to ask that we place it to a vote to add this proposal as an amendment to the plan for the board. Uh, Mrs. Erman, if I could address uh, two things. Number one, I'd like to thank you for speaking for your neighborhood as a group rather than having everyone <coughs> come up one by one. Um, second of all, what Mrs. Shields was referring to was that the committee's recommendation has <coughs> not changed. Once okay. we hear all of the input tonight under audience of citizens, when we get to that item in the agenda, I will open it up for full board discussion okay. in terms of whether any board members would like to make any adjustments compared, uh, considering what we have heard here tonight. Okay, I'm sorry, I so, misunderstood. Yes, we will get to that in the agenda, but right now we would just like to hear those who would like to give us comments okay. on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jennifer Schultz. I live on in the same section as Wendy Urban, but on the other side of the creek. Um, I live at 902 Buckboard Way. My plea to the board tonight is that the 20 plus children in section 27 be returned to the original plan to have them attend Walton Farm. I'm told the Walton Farm can accommodate 100 more students than will actually be attending there under the current plan. 
In my portion of Section 27, there are four out of five families whose children have all or most of their friendships with neighbors who are now moving to Walton Farm. We would otherwise be pleased to stay at Inglewood, but our children's friends are now at Walton Farm. The district management involved in the task force has stated that preventing disruption of neighborhoods <coughs> could not be a criteria for redistricting. I disagree and would ask that the board question such thinking that would cast aside such an important part of our children's well-being. I ask that the board be more sensitive to these pleas for neighborhood integrity than the committee has been allowed to be. To a child, changing buildings is nothing, but losing friends is everything. Please place Section 27 back in Walton Farm. Good evening. My name is John McCartney. I live at Bradford Lane, uh, Section 25. I would like to first thank the committee and the board members in its effort and time preparing the attendance boundaries. It must have been a consuming, arduous, and as we know, thankless job. <laughs> Worst of all, a monumental task to try to please everyone. This is my third time at the microphone, and I hope to have the same success as the others before me had in making changes. The change I seek is for the children of Section 25 to be sent to Gwinnett Square School, where they were originally slated to go, and for those children of Section 24 currently living in Upper Gwinnett to go there as well. I believe this would be an even swap for those children in Section 13 who reside in Tillamanson Township. You could kill two birds with one stone by allowing the children of Section 12 and 13 who currently play together, as stated in previous meetings, stay together. If I could digress a little bit, I myself am a product of uh, North Penn High School system, uh, kinderg kindergarten through 12th grade, and know firsthand what an excellent system we have. I have lived here most of my life, own my own business located in Upper Gwinnett, and do not plan to leave anytime soon. I do not seek this change because I do not want my daughter to go to the Inglewood school, or because it is not the newest school, or because it isn't closer, or that I cannot see it out of my window. I ask you make this change out of fairness. I think you have to ask the question, is it fair that in 1999-1991, we were told we were going to Gwynn Square School, then pulled out of the mix? Then again in 93, this year, we were initially told we were going to Gwinnett Square and yet again pulled out of the mix. That section 13 was heard first and got a change and we were second but no change. Is it fair that the committee listened to sections 13 uh, but not ours? Is it fair that the committee has made 11 changes but not one for us? Is it fair that the committee did not come and ask us if we cared about being moved? And is it fair that we were, we were happy with the original plan and because someone else was unhappy, we are to pay for their unhappiness? I ask the board, in light of these questions, please vote your conscience, vote your sense of fairness, and I plead with you to make this change. Thank you. My name is Steve Carrada. I live at 425 Franklin Street in Lansdale. And as a member of the district, as a former student, and now as a homeowner, I respectfully request that you reconsider the elementary school attendance areas, as was mentioned previously. Uh, I reside in Section 24 and would like to stay with Gwinnett Square. I sincerely appreciate the efforts of Dr. Burke Stevenson and the entire school staff at Gwinnett Square. Uh, I, again, I am also a product of the North Penn School District, and I went to an elementary school, the same elementary school the entire time, and enjoyed the continuity of having the same friends and seeing the same faces each and every year. If you go ahead with your current plan, Section four, uh, 24 students will have moved twice to two different schools. Again, I ask that you reconsider, and I'd like to see my children continue to go to Gwinnett Square. Thank you. Uh, my name 
My name is Charles Taylor. I live on Jackson Street in the area referred to, I guess, as 25 on the map. Uh, this may be a little bit broken because I'm going to try not to repeat some of the things that have been said by people who have been up here before me. But it struck me as curious that when they first opened the uh, Gwyneth Square School, that they, sections 24 and 25 were slated to go over there. So we sort of primed our kids for it and told them because the maps come home and they know what they are. Uh, then there were complaints for various reasons. People were dissatisfied and bingo, as my predecessor said, we're out. We go off to Gwynnor. Now my children have settled into Gwynnor and they're quite content there. Uh, then all of a sudden with the addition of new elementary schools, we're being asked to move again. Uh, it strikes me as odd that each time a committee, and there have been two now, have come up with this uh, restructuring of the boundaries, the original recommendations are to put these same two sections, 24 and 25, over in Gwinnett Square. And yet the minute that anybody on the periphery of this complains about it, the first people chucked to the wind, if you will, are the people in section 24 and 25. Now, as Living in Section 25, I feel a little bit better than I imagine people in Section 24 whose children will now be moved for maybe a third time in as many years. I personally find that offensive. Uh, if the board is really bent on moving our children to another school, I would like for that school to be in my township, where my children are active, where their friends are. Uh, which is Gwinnett Square. My children play Squires football, you know, Norgwin baseball. They swim at the pool over there. While I'm sure that Ingleside is a very nice school, I'm sure that the same uh, caliber of people, very nice people live there. This live where we live. But my children's friends are over here. If you're bent on moving them, I'd like to see them move to Gwinnett Square. And barring that, I'd like to see them left alone back at Gwynnor, where they've been for several years now, and they've settled in, and they're happy. If this small wedge representing these two areas is sufficiently small that people generally don't listen and you don't feel particularly uncomfortable about shuffling us back and forth, then perhaps it's small enough that you can leave us right where we are if worse comes to worse. <coughs> really all I had to say. Hi, I'm Janet Vitus from Section 12 on the map, um, representing the neighborhood of Kindle and Amber Lane. Um, I would just like to ask you one last time to consider using the boundary of North Penn High School, if possible. Um, as a dividing line to allow the there are eight kids in the neighborhood I believe last time I quoted seven I had missed a kindergartner there are eight kids for the last three years these kids have become part of the Gwinnett Square family they have bust with section 13 they have been in section thir with kids in section 13 in and out of school in extracurricular activities as well and the breakdown of the kids would only be two for sixth grade, one for fifth next year, two for fourth, two for third, one in second, and one in first. And the oldest remaining child in the neighborhood is three years old, which would not be of school age for another three years. Um, so I, with considering these numbers of eight kids, these kids were also moved twice, or this would be the second move. They were moved once before. Eight kids is not going to affect the numbers either way, and I just ask you one last time to please consider the friendships that these kids have made over the last three years and allow them to uh, remain at Gwinnett Square. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Cindy Sheets. I also live in Section 12. Um, Basically, we were pulled out of Inglewood two years ago. My son's now in the fourth grade at Gwinnett Square, and I've spoken to the group before. Um, we were one of 20, there's 28 children pulled out of Inglewood from 
that entire school. So we went through the process of moving to a new school without friends and have adjusted to, to a new school. Um, I don't think the committee or the board is going to be able to please everyone in the district. And I think that they've made an honest, committed effort to do the best possible um, drawing of lines and whatever that they can do. So I'm going to reiterate an <coughs> earlier proposal made by a neighbor, a neighbor of mine, and that is that you consider um, for Section 12 and some of the other sections that are looking at a second move, grandfathering out those children who are affected in a first move. In Section 12, there's currently 33 children, but only 10 of those were moved before. Um, we have new developments. We have children just starting school. So those children have not undergone an initial move. Um, so if possible, I would like you to consider not restructuring your lines, but giving parents the option, if their children have moved before, of grandfathering their children out and having them complete their elementary school career in the same school. Um, for my son, that would be two more years, the fifth and sixth grade. If that's not possible in terms of school transportation, I would personally say as a parent that I am willing, I feel so strongly committed to this that I am willing to provide my own transportation for two years if it means keeping my child in the same school. Um, ideally, the school district would provide the transportation, but I'm willing to do that if, if need be. I think we need to look at the minority, these kids as a special group within the district since they did undergo an initial move. <coughs> and I would appreciate your consideration of that. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Gretchen Herney, 329 Evergreen Drive. My daughter is currently at North Wales Elementary. I wrote to every member of the board trying to point out some specific uh, reasons why I think North Wales should be looked at in any way you possibly can to give us some more space. If it's a case of moving more children out, if it's a case of putting modulars in, please do something. We have a condition now that I think should have offered classroom space to us this year. We've got instruction taking place in closets. Um, we, we have art on a cart this year. We have music on a cart this year. I know in your utilization chart that you're showing next year we will have an art room, but we have the, the sixth grade class at maximum, 28 students. The fifth grade class is one student shy of maximum. The fourth grade class is seven students shy of maximum. I know that the figures for the, for the younger classes look smaller than that and look like, well, a few years will be crowded, we'll be fine. But I am also very proud of, of our teachers, what they've accomplished and the conditions they're working in at the moment. I, I must congratulate Dr. Sugar for his move up, I guess, to get his own school, but that is another reason that our school is going to be in flux. We don't know who our principal is going to be. We don't know what teachers are still going to be there because he has a choice of staff, I understand. Um, how many teachers, are, if they get a choice, are going to want to stay where the classroom sizes are at maximum, where they may get the closet for their speech class or whatever is available. Please look at our school. Please give us some space. I'm begging you. Um, I don't know how to make you understand unless you go and look. I'm very proud of what the people are doing there. They're working very hard. They're, very, they're a very vital organization over there. I love this school. I want somebody to pay attention to it. If you've got a module that's freed up when you reorganize the junior high, <coughs> please think about us. Don't wait till the last minute and say, okay, well, we'll give you the art room for the sixth grade for your extra third grade class, but what about the fifth grade? We're one student shy there. If we only have one classroom to give, which is the art room right now, and that goes for an extra student, according to your guidelines, we get one more student, we get that classroom, but if we get a second <coughs> student, just one other, According to your guidelines, we should have a classroom, but we don't have the room to put them in. We have no more closet space. We have no more room. Please, since we don't know about our principal now, we don't know what teachers we're going to get or keep, please think about getting, getting us some space somehow. Thank you. Mrs. Hearn, I just feel uh, constrained to make a comment about some of the things you said. First of all, and I, you made this statement before, and I corrected it then, and I will do so again this evening. Uh, 
the instruction that you refer to going on in a closet is not a classroom. Uh, it is a case where it's a speech therapist who works with perhaps one or two youngsters at a time. I think it should also be made clear uh, that Mr. Wood, the, the facilities manager, uh, did a very good job of thoroughly renovating that space. It is I, an attractive. Excuse me, I'm not arguing that point. Well, I, I, I really just want to make not. that clear. Secondly, uh, relative to your concerns about uh, <coughs> class size, they are clearly within the class size guidelines. If you look over the facilities chart, you will see <laughs> that at uh, several schools, Oak Park, there are a number of grade levels where uh, similar numbers exist. That's also true at the Nash School at one grade level. It's true at Hatfield at a, a grade level. It's also true at Knapp. And I have said this to you in conversation before. It is not atypical for us to be looking at those kinds of numbers uh, at this point in the year. This is an annual process that we use to determine staffing for the subsequent year. So it's not peculiar to the attendance area problem. And I have pointed out before that this board has in the past been willing to create new classes when the administration felt uh, that that in fact needed to be done. You heard this evening a report from the facilities committee that this board did authorize and modulars were, uh, are under construction and they will be completed at the Culp School. I think it's, it's also the case. Uh, we experienced uh, uh, a problem at the Montgomery School for this term. And this board did lease a modular and put it in place. The point I make is that the administration and the board have been very responsive to the kinds of concerns that you express. But, but from doing this for 10 or 12 years, it is not prudent to act at this point on what may happen. I will tell you that enrollments may rise and enrollments may decline. There is every, much, uh, every bit as much reason to believe that the enrollment may go down by several children as it is to believe that it will rise by several children. We have watched that historically. Yes, I appreciate that. I thought this was a, a chance for uh, comments from the audience, not a debate. I'm not trying to get into an argument. Um, I congratulate the board for taking care of Montgomery and Culp and some of the other situations. I am saying, I'm not saying that, there, that the closet is a classroom. I'm saying it, the closet is used for instruction. It is not used to store materials. <laughs> we are running out of closet space just for materials. We have some valuable teachers over there that have to use a closet space for any kind of instruction. Whether it's for 15 kids, 10 kids, or one kid, should we be using a closet for that? Now, you say that, the, that we might have the, the students go down, but we might have them go up. That's why I'm asking you to please look at the unique situation over at North Wales. We are now going to lose our principal and maybe lose a fair amount of staff. So, and that's all I'm asking. Just look, please. Mr. Kepper, I, I had respond, responded to the letter that Mrs. Herney, I guess, sent to all the members of the board. I did call her. and. Uh, you know, she did say the things to me on the phone that she said here tonight, and uh, they caught me off guard, and I, I guess I, um, being comfortable and happy as a clam over there in North Wales and content with what my children's education and the fact that I had two kids go through speech therapy in, in the closet that she speaks of, uh, and, and, I, and I don't say that to be humorous, I mean, I, I, I pledge to this woman, and I will hold to that pledge, that I will, she asks us to look at it. I think it's a simple request on her part, and, and I would ask that you'd find time in your busy schedule, if you would, to just walk through that with me. Um, <coughs> as the only board member Sorry. out of North Wales, I feel a real sense of duty. Uh, I respect her concerns. Uh, she sounds like us. What she has in common is she's a loving mother, yeah, and she's a loving parent. And so I want to go over there and look at her and try and see we it from her eyes. I told her I did not agree. But I, I want to do that, and I want to attempt to see what she seeks, uh, and also want to, you know, let's let's, let's talk about uh, what does happen to any modulars that come up and are available. So, um, if you would do that, please, if you sure. would find look in your schedule, and let's that. just take that walk and uh, we can do that tomorrow, and respond to that simple request. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm Jerry Collins, and I'm uh, a parent of two in Inglewood School, and I came uh, this evening really to listen and see how the decision making process uh, takes place. And I guess I have uh, several displeasures, and I'd, I'd like to just vocalize that. Um, one is 
uh, what I'm hearing is a very pejorative point of view toward Inglewood School. Uh, my children go to Inglewood School. I think it's an excellent school. And I think that there's several questions that I have to ask as a parent. <coughs> what is the problem with Inglewood School that everyone seems to want to avoid it? That's number one. Uh, number two is the quality of education is primary. I think if you, your children have friends, my children's friends are leaving. A large number of my children's friends are going to Walton Farm School. They will not see their friends in school, but they will continue to be friends. So I don't think that, to me, is a valid argument. To me, the valid argument is toward quality education. And your decision should be driven by where will the boundaries establish quality education in this community? How can we continue it? And if we aren't making decisions along those lines and boundaries aren't structured with that consideration in mind, I think you're taking the responsibility. And as far as alienating part of the community, if I did, I'm sorry, but it's my pleasure. My name is Barbara Kesselring. I live at 1125 Jarvis Lane. And I'd like to come in front of the board tonight and publicly thank you for your recommendation to allow the Jarvis, Scobie, Breezewood area to remain at Gwinnett Square. Um, our area was slated to move. Um, it would have been the third move for our children in five years. The board saw fit on November 9th at the working session to make a re recommendation to allow our area to remain in Gwinnett Square. And it was heartfelt thanks that I, that I come in front of you tonight that you will allow our area to remain in Gwinnett Square. I also come in front of you for all those areas who are pleased with the, the lines that you have drawn and who may not have the opportunity to come up and speak tonight. Um, we are all grateful for the hard work that the task force and the board has done. Hello, my name is Donna Malone, 108 State Street in Lansdale. Uh, our children not to be cards to be dealt about to the different schools. We have to think of the psychological aspect of the moves. It's difficult for some children to adjust going to a new school in a different community, making new friends, new administration, fitting in, and are some of the concerns they need to deal with. Here along State Street, Section 24, where I live, our children have gone to York Avenue School four years ago, the Gwyneth Square School for three years, and now we'll have to go to Inglewood. <coughs> Inglewood is probably a fine school, but the moves maybe a little much. I believe there's a lot of shuffling around for these children. It's bad enough that our development, Stony Creek, was already split with half going to the Gwyn North School and half going to the Gwyneth Square School, with the break just being one road away. I say let's have some unity and consistency. School board members, vote on what you think is right. Let's think of our children and their futures. Thank you. My name is Connie Spire. I live at 228 Stephen Road. Uh, that's in Upper Gwinnett. My children go to North Wales. Um, I'm going to try and touch on um, a couple different questions that I have that I don't think I've made clear um, in the last few times I've spoken. And it's out of concern for the lack of space, again. Um, one is that I feel that when we are settling for a lower quality of education, I think it's important that we acknowledge that we are doing so, that we don't try and gloss it over and make it rosy and say it's the same, but we're just paying loss, less for it, okay? Because I think if we continue to do this type of thing, the sad fact is, is that our children will end up paying for it in the long run. So what I'm saying is, at this point, we're talking about um, doing art and music on a cart, I understand why that's being done. It's to save a huge expense with the new school. Um, but I think we need to determine uh, guidelines, limits for how low we are willing to allow our quality to go down. And when we reach those limits, we need to stick to them. And we have to act <laughs> responsibly and be accountable. Okay, currently, the guideline for the maximum number in classes grade four through six is 28. Okay, this has been mentioned. With one more student at this time, we usually add another class. But as you know, we are in a situation, and as Mr. Kever said, that there may be one or two other elementaries that are in a similar situation where there is not another class available. 
talking. In North Wales, we're talking th three more students, and we would need two classes, and we have one to give up. All right, so now we're talking about adding an aide to a classroom. So I have some questions about this. I would like to know, are we talking about a full-time aide in one classroom, or are we talking about an aide who is shared and therefore part-time in each classroom, in that grade level? Uh, it, it depends uh, you know, on each situation as an individual case. Uh, I would rather doubt that this board would uh, approve a full-time aide uh, in any classroom because there is one additional children, one additional child, Mrs. Spire. I think that what we have done is we've looked at it on a case-by-case -case basis and made our <laughs> decisions accordingly. I would also point out that these aides are, uh, at this point in time, fully certificated as teachers. I would think that if you had uh, two people in a classroom, uh, even if one of them is only there part-time, that's still advantageous uh, to youngsters in that situation as it is opposed, let's say, if you have 29 youngsters in one room and 28 in another. I still think that's educationally advantageous. Um, I understand what you're saying, but I still think we need to acknowledge that we are settling for lower quality than actually adding Absolutely. another Absolutely. classroom and lowering the number of children in each class at that grade level. Okay, but if I'm not saying that I'm going to, I just think we have to acknowledge what we're doing as being what it is. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, now the aid will. We've said that we're talking about an aid that will be added with 29 or 30 students. Okay. I'm, I'm suggesting that that's one of the possible solutions to problems when we exceed class size guidelines. Okay. All right. Well, what my next question is, at what point do we go back to adding another classroom, and what is the magic number? I mean, are we... There, there, instance, is, there is no magic number. I've already said it's dependent on an evaluation in each particular case. So we could end up with 31 or 32 children in the classroom with an aide? Well, I would rather doubt that, but I, but I think I'd stand on the answer I gave. Okay. I guess I would prefer, feel more comfortable as a parent and taxpayer to see guidelines written out so that I could feel ensured that the quality of our children's education is similar to the other elementary schools. Mrs. Um, Barry, you know, I don't want to debate this with you, but I would simply say to you that at this point we operate some 200 and 40 classes and a, a, a handful of those are in excess of the class size guidelines and where that is true it's never true by more than uh, one or two students. I think that certainly demonstrates the willingness of this board uh, to maintain quality education at least as it relates uh, to class size. Okay, I guess I'm looking ahead with what was mentioned about um, up to 800 more students to put into these 13 schools <coughs> and that I realize that we may be in that position in the future even though we haven't been in the past. Okay, I'd like to know if our current guidelines include special ed children in the student numbers. They are included. Okay, but they aren't in the numbers of the spatialization chart. They are not included in their classrooms. If they were, we'd have over 28 already. Well, I'm not going to debate that. Okay, well, I think it's easy enough for everybody if they want to turn to the space utilization chart. Ms. Fire, I'm sorry. First of all, I don't know if all the board members have that here. And you've gone over your five minutes. I suggest if you want to look at actual numbers that you need to make an appointment and sit down with Mr. Pepper to do that, rather than taking the time up here to do that. The board has gotten a number of letters over the last week or two from North Wales parents. I've asked Dr. Elko and Mr. Pepper to look into the situation. Those Mrs. Oh. Mangle's going out. Oh, certainly. Room. Yes, certainly. and I don't think we Help need to that. debate this issue tonight. I think it will be looked at, and the administration and the board will have to make a decision as to whether there's any actions need to be taken right now. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Jack Masty, and I live at 1685 Jack's Circle. Section 13. Um, I didn't realize going into this the, the emotion that uh, school redistricting uh, brings to uh, brings to the community, but it certainly it certainly has. And uh, clearly, this is not a win-win. If if it were, I'm sure um, those of you on the task force would have tried to accomplish that. Um, some parents are happy, and some are not, and that's just the way it's I guess has has to be. Um, 
I'd like to uh, compliment the work of the task force and the committee. Um, I believe they did a thorough uh, and a professional job. I believe that um, they did come out with an initial proposal that elicited a lot of response from the community. They listened to that, that community feedback and they made adjustments <laughs> and they made um, some revisions that not only uh, responded to those people with the feedback, but it also, and I think more significantly, better accomplished the goals that were put forward by the task force and by the board. I believe the, uh, the board needs to defer, should consider deferring to the committee's recommendation. Um, the committee has heard all of the, uh, has been through all of the public comment meetings, um, listened to the debate back and forth, and I believe put forward a reasoned proposal. Um, I guess the, the proof of the pudding is how the numbers tie in to the goals. And if Mr. Keffer is correct, uh, the, the revised proposal of the task force more, more, more evenly spreads out the density of the schools, particularly as it relates to Gwinnett Square and Montgomery Elementary, thereby allowing more room for growth, which I think is important. It also and very significantly in my personal case, reduces the number of students who are going to have to move for a second and in some cases a third time, which I think is, uh, is uh, Mr. Collins talked about quality of education uh, for decision making. I think that's, uh, that's a point that can't be uh, underscored strong enough. And I believe it more adequately drew the lines proximate to, to neighborhoods. And I think that was evidence with Glendale um, coming in to uh, Glenn Square, responding to that, that kind of feedback. Um, I realize that the people in certain sections, and in our case, 24 and 25, feel as though they're, they've lost. Um, um, there's nothing that we, I'm, I'm going to change that feeling. But again, I think the numbers in those instances um, against the goals prove that I think it was a smart it was a smart decision from the standpoint the density of Gwinnett Square goes down from 88 percent to 82 percent and 10 fewer children are going to move a second time. Um, the committee put in a lot of hours, um, listened to a lot of feedback. Frankly I stood up at the first meeting and I was somewhat s skeptical that anything was going to be done that any changes were going to be made. Um, I'm pleased that, uh, that in my case that, that, that the changes were made. Um, I believe the school board has a responsibility to vote for the proposal that makes the best sense for the district as a whole. And I urge you to uh, vote this forward. Thank you very much. Do you have any other comments this evening? My name is Mark Euling, and I live at a 1697 Meadow Glen Drive in Talmadge Township. And my child was one of the ones that was moved uh, during the last elementary school realignment. I've got an observation, very short observation, and a concern that I'd like to mention tonight. My ob observation is that the task force advisory committee was empowered to evaluate and recommend the best, most equitable plan for re realigning the elementary education areas based on facts, factors such as the proximity to the school class size, and minimizing the multiple moves of our children. This task force has done what it was charged to do. They've met with the concerned parents at multiple public sessions, they've reviewed the input, and they've presented a final plan which should be approved tonight. As has been said before, very few people are comfortable with change, and it's a shame how subjects like uh, school realignment can polarize a community. However, my concern is that if we continually alter our proposed plan based on the last, loudest argument, this process will never end. And I feel we are doing a disservice to our children, continuing the ongoing, or I'm sorry, the on-again, off-again concern over impending moves. I recommend it that the school board tonight approve the realignment plan and move forward tomorrow with positive plans to tra transition children that will be affected by these moves. My name's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Dan Waters. I'm 915 Tennis Way in Lansdale. 
Um, I'm representing part of the group that uh, Wendy Urban spoke for. And um, I've heard Mr. Collins and the gentleman who just preceded me. Um, I, too, share his concerns that we have an equitable situation. I would ask you, as Wendy asked you, that you take an opportunity to hear um, not the last loudest voice, but the voice uh, of the same decision-making process that you used in handling all the other concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Davis. If you would turn to, B, to page BA1 of your agenda, item 5A, I recommend the approval of the waiver of tuition status for students whose names are on file.